Okay. Um, Josh, are you recording locally on your end, too? Oh, I'm, I'm not. going to let the I Riverside do the, do the work. Um, I, yeah, I can. I, I totally forget I, about that. Ah, oh, crap. Is it Audacity I use? How good your internet right now? If you can trust it, I'll just grab it off Riverside. <laughs> oh, here. I, I'm in uh, Skip. Okay. And record. Let me make sure I'm getting it. Oh, yeah. Okay. There you go. Audacity yep. backup. Cool. Okay. That'll keep us safe. Okay. And again, I'll kick us off, and then um, we'll have some fun. We'll talk about Alex and marginal <laughs> gains. Cool. Sounds good. All right, marginal gains. <clears throat> Sorry about that. <clears throat> okay, marginal gains listeners and uh, viewers on YouTube. Again, welcome to the channel. Glad you are tuning in. We have a great guest today, and Josh. Uh, Josh is here with us, along with our guest, Josh. You know, uh, about a year ago, I interviewed Guillaume Boivin of Israel Premier Tech. And Guillaume had a top ten in Roubaix, and I was very excited to talk to him. But uh, before I could get a word out of my mouth, and Guillaume had become a marginal gains listener himself, he said, Hadi, you have to. You have to have Alex Dowsett on your program. He is by far the most marginal gain we have, marginal gain or we have on the Israel Premier Tech team. So what do you know? Here we are a year later, uh, and we have Alex Dowsett as our guest. Alex, uh, thanks for joining the show. All the way from Andorra, I hear? Yes, yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you to Guillaume for teeing this up, it seems. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm up in Andorra at the moment. And, uh, yep. Enjoying the slopes. Enjoying the slopes, <sighs> enjoying the, the retirement life, I hope. Mm. Yes, uh, yes. For now, I guess, um, I started bike riding again, a longer off season than I would have normally. It's been a, it's been a very interesting transition. Um, and then, you know, certainly when we're moving back to the UK uh, in the spring, and I will be chucking myself back into sort of time trials and, and other forms of bike racing, uh, just for for fun. Um, but you know, I'm a competitive guy, so the itch needs to be scratched. <laughs> yeah, yeah, talk talk to us a little bit about that. I know, uh, I think all the every former pro I've ever spoken with kind of talks about you know, there's like that transition, which just it's got to be so hard. Um, you know, you, the thing that you've done every day for your life mm. with all this focus, and then it, it kind of goes. I mean, there. Other than like retiring from your career, you know, later in life, like that just doesn't happen for most most people. But it happens, you know, for cyclists. You're what in your thirties? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it is surreal. It's uh, it's like I've experienced almost a, a full life cycle, with the exception of death, before I hit thirty five. Um, I think for me, it's been easier that it was retirement on my terms. I made the call. Mm. So, sort of, you know, Chanel and I, uh, my fiance, we collectively decided that this would be the final. Twenty twenty two would be the final year during the summer, um, and <coughs> that then makes life a lot easier to to step away, you know, to plan for it, and to be ready for it. I think I feel the guys who have it forced upon them um, struggle with it much more. Uh, mm. But the, the, the transition has been great. It's the bit I've really struggled with is, um, I'm not struggled, it's like a nice thing, but is, as a pro, there's, there's constant analysis, like you turn up to November camp, and even though the teams are like, oh, it's November, you're on holiday, you know they're <laughs> looking, you know, like, oh, who's, who's had a good off season, right. who's kept himself in shape, <laughs> there's, you know, there's eyes on you. Um, yeah. So I think it's, and, and certainly, I then have that pressure on myself. I'm like, oh, I need to, yeah, I want to enjoy myself, but not too much because the more I like, let myself go in terms of fitness and, and uh, well, body weight, um, mm. just partying, the, the more work I know I'm going to have to do on the other side. And, and then it's like having to catch myself on and go, and actually, the only person that cares right now is you. And 
I think that was that was a difficult one when I'd see all of my former teammates start to train again and they're all like post online, oh off season's over, back like first day back at work and that I'm like, ah, oh, not for me. I'm still gonna <laughs> off season. So um yeah, that that side of things has been has been very refreshing. Right? It's a sense of, of freedom and both that is both has been both daunting as well as uh, liberating. So um it's been good, though. It's been good. That's great. That's great. Well, you, you sure seem busy. I feel like I've seen your name pop up in association with what, No Pins. Mm. And um, and you're doing the... I'm blanking on the name of it. Um, that's why I should write stuff down. <laughs> the the um, real-time arrow measuring... Oh, bo- yeah, Body Rocket, yes. Yeah. Body Rocket, um, yeah, thank you. Yeah, and, and working with the junior team as well, which is... Um, oh, wow. Which has been... Fun. I've, I've not met them, but we've been on Zoom calls and sort of trying to help them help fast track um, their um, you know, so they they say that they don't make the mistakes that I did. Um, yeah, and that's uh, that's been really really fun as well. So yeah, certainly very busy. Um, it was definitely a period of it was like a chicken and the egg situation where I, I had tentative chats and. Um, with no pins and it was all basically like well you need you need to retire I was like yeah I do um, and they're like if you do then yeah we can talk I'm like but until I do none of this is going to happen so I'm like there was like a few weeks where sort of we had to take the plunge and I'm like okay like we need to work out how we're going to how we're going to survive put food on the table next year but it was I, I had some um, it's interesting Annette Edmondson had retired uh, an Australian track and road cyclist, very successful one. She'd retired the year before, and she said, "You would be amazed with once you make that announcement, the sort of the opportunities that come in, and some of them real left field." And um, she was like, "You'll you'll be fine." And yeah, and, and she was a hundred percent right. So, it's, no, that's it's, fantastic. It's, we're busy. It's, yeah, yeah. Well, it sure looks like it, and I, I'm really happy for you because it's. You've got so much energy and passion and, and like Hadi said, the marginal gains mentality and everything. So as, as those announcements would come across, I just kept thinking like, oh, yeah, that fits. <laughs> that yeah. fits. That's a good match, right? Yeah. So yes, and awesome that much. you're working with, with juniors to give back. I think that's, that's just mm-hmm. – it's super important, right? I mean, I think of all the people that we've talked about that on this show before, right? All the – we're all here because somebody did that for us, you know, at some level. And, yeah, um, and then being able to to take someone at who made it where you made it to to give back like that is just so powerful. So, really yeah. well done. No, thank you, thank you. So, why don't we talk about the junior time for you? Al. How did the bike come into your life? When was the first time you said, hmm, "Bike, I'm oh. going to get on that thing"? Um. Oh, so that's. Uh, so I, I, I mean, I guess it actually starts with my medical condition, hemophilia. Um, I was not allowed to do a lot of sports at school, a lot of the contact sports. Um, our rugby, which is, I guess, your, your American football. Um, our football, it's your soccer. Um, uh, yeah, and, and probably that makes up for like 99% of sporting in school. And uh, yeah, so I wasn't allowed to do that because of the risk, um, the sort of contact aspect to it. and. As, as a kid, I'd been swimming a lot because the doctors for my condition had said that's one of the best ways of helping manage the condition. Um, and I, I think stubbornly, I'd spent a childhood... We, we see it a lot with the young haemophiliacs. Um, uh, you spend a childhood of being told what you can't do. And I think... And they're sort of sitting on the sidelines to an extent. And so you... You develop a stubborn attitude where you either go and do that anyway, or if you were like me with like my parents, they'd say, "Okay, we can't do that, but let's go try this instead." And you know, I had a father who was a very successful race car driver, um, and you know, alongside of being told what I can't do, was also hearing, asking my father, my dad, Phil, um, and listening to him tell stories of his sporting background. I, mean, I just developed. I was like, I need to. I, I think my, the most. There's one thing my dad had said to me when I was a kid, and, and 
it's, it's probably the, the biggest thing that sat with me is that he says you, you could have Michael Schumacher level race car drivers just walking down your local high street but until they get the opportunity to get in the car and sort of show themselves they'll never realise that potential um, mm. so I was like well I need to I need to find my I need to find what I'm Michael Schumacher at and I and we we did sports and I like sports that were hemophilia friendly and the minute I felt that I could not be world class at, at them I dropped them pretty quick I just lost interest and um, yeah and then um, my dad started mountain biking with a bunch of his friends and one of one of the guys Eric he his son raced in the same team as Mark Cavendish at the time and yeah, time trialling, like club time trialling is a massive thing in the UK and he mm. took me along to watch his son race a local time trial. I had a go on his road bike because those are the thing, road bikes weren't super accessible to ride unless you knew someone and could ask them to have a go. Otherwise, you had to go and spend... I, think the cheap, I looked, the cheapest bike in um, Halfords, which is like a, you know, as cheap as you'd get in the UK, was £400, which isn't... It's not a small amount of money. Um... Yeah. So it was fortunate. He so you can have a go. A week later, I went and did a ten mile TT. Um, Twenty eight minutes and one second was was the <laughs> was the time, and it was on the course that we will likely talk about, and I talk about a lot, which is the Molden Ten. Um, and there's been a labour of love for the last two decades, um, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, and and then. I just kept chipping away. I enjoyed each week. I'd get faster and faster. And, and a couple of people said to my dad that I was very good, but we didn't really... Like, we hadn't exposed ourselves to a, um, anything bigger than club level, uh, so we didn't really know. And then I... The, the moment... The moment was... I'd qualified for the schoolboys 10-mile time trial, like, national final. There was 120 kids from across the UK... Um, and I'd qualified by the skin of my teeth so I was still on very much progressing at a fast rate of knots uh, I was one of the early starters posted up a PB I obliterated my own PB um, I had the fastest time by an awful long way I was 14 at the time and, and, and as all of the results trick, uh, as all of the riders trickled in I had to wait almost two hours for everyone to finish um, I realised I had beaten all of the 40, I was fast as 14 year old, I was fast as 15 year old, and then we're going through the final 10, I'm riding faster and faster and faster and faster, and then the last guy set off, um, and I was faster at the halfway mark, and, and, I, and he's told me since someone screamed at him at the last way, at the halfway mark, you're down on some nobody kid, um, and he turned that around, beat me, that was Ian Stannard, who I'd go on to be teammates <laughs> with, friends with. Um, but the whole top 10, it was all 16 year olds and there was 14 year old me in second place. And I just, I, I didn't really care much that I'd finished second because was, this was just one big fairy tale. And I looked at that results board and I was like, this is it, I found my sport. I found, I found what I was put on here to do. Um, so then we go back to the doctors, my doc, hemophilia doctors, because obviously, Road cycling is a very good sport for haemophilia until you crash. And we said to them, oh, we'd, yeah. uh, seems we've taken up road cycling and it's, it's a thing we're quite good at. And the doctor had said, okay, well, we'd rather you play chess or a musical instrument, but also like, we want to support you in, in what you want to do. These are new, um, very sort of new days for haemophilia coming out of a bit of a dark age where the condition was, it's far more manageable than it used to be. And, so a lot more doors are opening for haemophiliacs than they used to be as well. So um, it was very much a, uh, yeah, we were entering uncharted territory, but we had full support from the doctors, which was, which was wonderful. And that was the, yeah, that was the start of the journey. Wow. And, and the, cause we have pretty, we have quite good medicine now, correct? And so when, I guess, when in your life did that come to be? Cause it, oh, sorry, I mean, it hasn't. It's for haemophilia. It's, yeah, haemophilia. It's, it's mind blowing. If I was born in the sixties, I would not have made it past adolescence. Um, as in, like I would be dead. Um, if I was during the eighties, 
there was a lot of so so I miss a crucial uh, clotting protein. It's the eighth, um, and there's a few things in my career that have like matched up. It, it's in a step stage of there's thirteen stages to your blood forming a clot, like coagulating, and I don't have the eighth one, and it's weird that I, both times I won a stage of Shiro was the eighth stage um, and uh, and the second and it's called fact, the medicine I take is called factor eight and I spent the last three years of my career on a factor um, just you know like not superstitious or anything like that I was yeah. like but that's weird um, yeah. so, <laughs> um, that's great so yeah so um, unfortunately before synthetic medication it was concentrated blood transfusions and there was an awful lot of haemophiliacs that were um, it's got a contaminated um, blood scandal and a lot of the donor um, donor blood was infected with HIV and hepatitis, there's an awful lot of haemophiliacs that also have that as if things weren't bad enough back then I missed that by the skin of my teeth basically um, for like very very lucky to have had the life I've had, but even luckier to have, to have missed that, to be honest. So it's yeah. um, it, it's very much groundbreaking. It, it's, I've said for a long time, I'm the only, I'm currently the only, uh, the first and only elite athlete with haemophilia, but there's going to be so many more. Um, it just, it's a case of timing. Yeah. I, I think what a lot of people might get confused about, Alex, is while cycling is not a contact sport, it can be a blood sport. We all mm. know about the crashing. So how is it you were able to negotiate that? You were not, you're told no soccer, no rugby, no pure contact sports, but cycling, where we all fall down, okay, we'll, we're okay with that. Yeah, I mean, I think when I was, I think if I wasn't good at it, it probably would have been a, quite a um, cold, hard no. And they just said stick to swimming. Um, but what the doctors did say in, in cycling's defence was it's very good. There's no impact, like, as opposed to running, you've got a lot of impact on joints. Uh, mm. Whereas cycling, it's very joint friendly. Um, I know that because I've started running, and it is not joint friendly <laughs> at all. Um, <laughs> but um, I think the, crucially, I think the, the quite forward-thinking doctors, like we are entering like, uncharted territory with hemophilia like this medication works now um, and it, th theoretically if I have my medication I have it every second day it gets me up to my levels up to like 60% and you only need more than 10% to operate normally um, hmm. so theoretically I'm a normal kid which then begs the question why can't we do rugby football um, right. and I think that's going to come I just it, we're not quite there yet because um, there's a lot of it, it gets a little bit more complicated in surgery and, and things like that and I think with certainly with rugby like with American football or ice hockey or, or that you're going to get hurt like that's the that's the name of the sport um, mm. that's what's going to happen so I think that's why we're still still trying to avoid there but it's you know it's, in, it's still improving so I think we're we'll, we'll hopefully get to a point where a haemophiliac life is a normal life. Yeah, no, that's. I, I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the story, but Ryan White, uh, American teenager who who died of AIDS, very famously uh, in the '80s, was from right here in Indianapolis. He actually went to school uh, about a kilometer from the Soka Building. Um, but that's that's just a huge, well-known story here in the states, and I think really educated a lot of educated but then i think also colored the opinion of a lot of americans about both hemophilia and uh hiv aids <clears throat> pardon me so yeah you know, he was you know i think up until then it aids had really been stigmatized as like a, a homosexual right. thing and and he was really the face of like no this you, you know that's not not necessarily the case and then i mean i remember being a kid it's first time i'd ever heard of hemophilia so really kind of brought it to the front um yeah but it's just amazing where where that's come with the, the medications. And I mean that you you got where you <laughs> where yeah. you got is I think is just so admirable and uh, and inspiring. So so which takes me to your um, your little bleeders. 
Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, which I, I also love because I feel like it's you Brits can get away with that. Like here in America, I think there'd be a lot of people like, like, well, that's offensive. You know, we don't want to insult them. Yeah. <laughs> like, I just think it's it's so clever. So tell tell us about uh, about Little Bleeders. <laughs> on, on the name, it was my former manager and I set up the the charity, and, and I said, I think we should call it Little Bleeders. He's like, no, I've got a team of people that will dream up a better name than that. And a couple of weeks later, he's like, so we can't dream up a better name than that. Um, and a lot of people get um, get it confused and call it little breeders. They're like, what kind of charity is that? <laughs> so, I don't think uh, we can support little breeders. No. no. <laughs> that would be worse. Yeah. <laughs> so we yeah, make sure we are very clear with the pronunciation. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think up until... It was my second year at Marvel Star. I had an opportunity with um, Pfizer, actually, uh, to travel around Europe um, talking about my story. That's all they wanted me to do. Um, and you know, because, I, and I understand the healthcare system in the US compared with Europe is quite different. Um, and, you know, yeah, Pfizer just wanted to facilitate helping tell my story to um, consultants, to uh, parents and to haemophiliacs to try and, because mm. there's a lot of negative stories and I was a positive one and it's like let's let's share that and um, so we did that and it, I, that was the moment I realised actually my what I was doing I, I just assumed loads of people, loads of haemophiliacs would be able to do what I was doing I didn't realise how um, sort of new it was I was just sort of following my own path um, and then uh, during that time it was called the Miles for Haemophilia campaign just realised how um, powerful my story was and you know, that was the point where we were like well we can we can do more with this we can we can set up a charity aimed at supporting young new, like new haemophiliacs and saying this isn't you know these are new grounds not to I think there's a lot of charities out there that support the um, you know the the historical haemophilia, and it's not to ignore that that you know we respect that that has happened, but there's there's charities that deal with that, and um, we're like we want to focus on the new, we want to educate consultants and parents, and uh, say look, you, you, this is a positive story, and um, you know it, it's we're promoting health mm. activity well-being because there's, there's a massive contradiction where you can so you, know, you need to protect your kids you need to wrap them up in cotton wool but um what my doctor was like actually you, you, alex needs to be active needs to be strong like strong joints um healthy not overweight because mm. that's like, that's extra weight on these joints that are gonna cause more bleeding episodes so and, and that's what we do at Little Bleeders. Um, and, and more recently, with the we introduced the Sports Fund, which has you know, it's been a massive cost of living crisis in the UK. Um, and a lot of families have, because a lot of the activities for haemophilia are extracurricular, and so providing some financial to support support to make sure that parents can get their little boy to like. Uh, Swimming classes, dance classes. I think there was someone like wanted to have some help buying a paddleboard because they had a lake nearby, just to help facilitate mm. the haemophilia-friendly activity. So it's been, you know, it's, it's been really fulfilling, um, and it's been a, I mean, it's it's nice because having the, the vehicle of cycling to actually put haemophilia on a more sort of global map as well, and this is quite a niche. Not an issue. You know, it's, it's classed as a rare disease, and um, if you like rare diseases, if you add up all of the rare diseases together, there's a pretty significant portion of the population, and, and they need representing. So, you know, hemophilia within the cycling world is, is in a lot of more people's eyes. They're a lot more educated on it, and that's um, you know, I think it's it's, just, it's been it's been an incredible journey for me personally, and it's just been really fulfilling that we can provide um, a positive story when there's so many negative ones. Yeah, no, that's that's fantastic. Really admirable. 
Well, 12 years in the uh, pro peloton for Alex and uh, an amazing record here, Alex. Uh, 15 professional victories, two in Grand Tours, six national TT titles. Amazing. You set the hour uh, record in 2015, two Commonwealth game medals, a gold and a silver. Just amazing. Um, a, a lot of people called you a specialist, I think, with good reason, right? You were a time trialist, and time trialists tend to be specialist if not marginal gainer so tell us about um your first awareness of of how little things could make you go faster and how you tried to influence others about hey maybe you try this or that you might find uh, some success I, oh, the, the second bit is, is banging your head against a brick wall a lot of the time because <laughs> there's, there's <laughs> trying to tell riders and then sometimes they're trying to tell whole teams and yeah. <laughs> it just it's like unfathomable that like we're um that I was starting to start and I credit almost all of my marginal gaining to the Molden Ten. Um that was my <laughs> wind tunnel, my I know the guys in Girona timed themselves at Rock Corva, it was my fitness testing ground. <laughs> um so basically in the UK like club time trialing is massive. It's you rock up on a Tuesday evening, you pay two or three pounds. Uh, you get a number and a start time. It's out, round, it's a turn right, left, 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 back five miles, and then cross the finish line. And every single week I went, provided I wasn't at a stage race, but I would go every single week with the aim of going faster. And once I realized I was kind of maxed out in terms of power, but that wasn't going to, I wasn't going to find another 100 watts. I was like, well, how... And at this point, I was in the 20s. I was, I was clocking 20 to 21 minutes. Um, and I was, you know, 30, 30 riders would turn up. I was not racing any of those. I was just racing myself on the clock. I mean, there was a chap there on a penny farthing who I'd usually catch and pass. And I think it's quite <laughs> surreal that I'm on. I mean, probably the best of the best when it comes to equipment. And there's guys rattling around in 30 to 10 miles in 31 minutes on a penny farthing, which was arguably the most impressive ride of the, uh, of the evening. Um, and I was just trying to go faster. So I was like, how can I go faster? Because I can't produce more power. Um, you know, that's, that's the slow burner. That's what we're working at long term to try and get better there. But like, how can I get into the 19s, um, which is a 30 mile an hour ride around this course um, with this amount of power. Power kind of became irrelevant and I think power meters have actually slowed a lot of time trialists down because suddenly that's the tangible metric that they're looking at and not the the finishing like the finishing time or the position that you finish in. So it was a large thing was pacing. Right? When the wind would always be different, trying to get pacing strategies right. Because I would theoretically I'm like, well, if it's tailwind out, headwind back, which is the most difficult way to pace it, I should be going, if, if 400 watts is my average, I should be going 380 in the tailwind, 420 in the headwind. The problem is I'd do 380 in the tailwind. I wouldn't actually go that fast. I'd get there, get to the turn. I'd be like, well, I need to now ride at 30 mile an hour, at least <laughs> into a headwind. I'm, I can't do that fresh, let alone. So there has to be a balance there. And then dig some deep, dug. Uh, dug into like, how power meters read in wind and so well, in a headwind you you lose that momentum that help with the inertia so actually a negative split actually looks like an equal on your power meter an equal power output out and back is, is kind of what I mm. ended up coming to the conclusion of um, so I'd find some speed there and then like just cornering speed and then and then it realized aerodynamics, like certainly around about 2014, 2015, the first hour record with Endura and getting into a wind tunnel, I saw just how big aerodynamics were going to be. And then the time around the Molden 10 just started tumbling. It was like, right, well, now we're going to get into the 18s. And that was my, that was my testing ground. That was my wind tunnel. That's where I found all the marginal gains and it was... Yeah, it was, it, I, it was something that only I had in the pro peloton, and it contributed to, I think, an awful lot of my results because, and, and I know because I've got friends, Ryan Mullen, who was a 
he's sort of parked time trialling a bit more now he's more of a lead out special lead out man we'd finish every TT and we'd be pretty comparable I would usually get the edge of, uh, edge over him but with about 20 or 30 watts less and it used to frustrate the hell out of him um, <laughs> I don't know, I just, he just yeah and I, I think just what I learned there was was huge um, I remember where I really realised I think what I knew and took for granted compared to other pros was um, a race, a TT I won in Germany uh, with Movistar. It was a 27k TT, and a very young Marc Soler just coming off of winning the Tour de Lavernet the year before. Um, both rode for Movistar. He afterwards he's like, Alex, can I ask you about your time trial? I was like, yeah, sure. He said. Um, he said, you know, the first question from the Spani- Spaniards, how heavy are you? And I was like, I am 78 <laughs> kilos. <laughs> He's like, oh, okay, well, I'm 70. I was like, cool. He says, well, how much power did you do? I said, 395 watts. He said, oh, well, I did 400. And I can see him doing the math. I'm like, you, <laughs> six watts per kilo, however many watts per kilo for you, however many more watts per kilo for me. Yeah. He's like, he beat me by two and a quarter minutes. I said, yeah. I said, okay, Mark. I was like, I, I'm interested that you're interested here. I said, let's let's talk about a few points on that TT because there's two. After one kilometer, I'm already ten seconds ahead. I said, you come down the ramp. What you sprinted up to speed, clicked up a few gears, sprinted up to speed again out of the saddle. He was like, yeah, yeah. I was like, cool. I sat down immediately <laughs> off the ramp. And accelerated at less than 500 watts. So I'm 10 seconds ahead, and I've done about 200 watts less than you have in the first kilometer. As I, and, and I don't want to talk about the rest of it because it was flat, but there was one section where it was uh, you're on like, the top of a plane, and then there was a big downhill into an uphill back onto the flat again. I said, I said, to him, I said So tell me, on the downhill, how much power were you doing? He was like, 400 watts. I was like, good. And on the uphill, how much power were you doing? He's like, 400 watts. I was like, right, <laughs> let me tell you what I did. I said, <laughs> once I got to the top of the hill, I accelerated like, as hard as I could, and then I sat on the top tube. I said, and how fast were you going on the downhill? It was like 60k an hour. I was like, right. I was doing 70 at zero watts. So my <laughs> average wattage is just going like this, <laughs> but I'm going 10 kilometers yeah. an hour faster than you are. So I start the climb 10 kilometers an hour faster than you do. So I'm decelerating at a lesser rate. I said, then you're doing 400 watts, I'm doing 550, because I've just had this big old rest on the downhill. So I'm actually doing more watts per kilo than you are on the up. So by the time we get to the top, you've that lost even more speed than I have. And then I'm having to re-accelerate from, I don't know, like 40 kilometers an hour, and you're having to re-accelerate from 30. But the difference is staggering. And yeah. so, and it, yeah, it was like, a, he got it. He got it. It was nice because he got it. And um, I think it's those things where I've managed to really um, punch well above my weight, I guess, my physiology, um, which has been, yeah, it, it's been very, uh, it's been fun. And then certainly in the latter, latter stages, really honing down on making the bike faster, all of those little things. You know, Dan Bigham, his sort of no um, mm. uh, no compromises approach really did. Um, you know, because I, I got a bit comfortable for a while, I'd say. I, I was, like, national TT title was pretty came quite easily. Um, I won that stage of the Giro, which I maintained was a wonderful thing to happen, but I did take my foot off the gas a little bit, because I was like, I'm there. Like, I'm, <laughs> I've done it. I'm one of the best, like, and did then kind of just take, you know, just that little bit of complacency. I was still trying to go fast around the Molden 10, but just, just, and then, yeah, Dan and Jan, Dan Big and John Archibald came along and they, they were doing to me what I was doing to Ryan Mullen. And I was like, right, I need to, I need to up my game again. And then it was, you know, uh, I was introduced to wax chains in my hour record, um, 2015. And then started looking, you know, tire pressures became a big thing. Uh, you know, gone were the days where you sat in the car park and if you flicked the ping your 19 mil tire and 
if everyone heard, <laughs> that means you were that means you were on the money. Like those days were gone. Um, <laughs> so it was, it was, yeah, and it, yeah, more accessibility to wind tunnels. Um, yeah, it was just I think it was certainly since 2015 really got into um, the more technological aspect of of marginal gaining. It's it's amazing to me, you know. I, <clears throat> started oh, I, I got into this like late 90s and you know CSC was the first team that I ever really worked with in my zip days and, and you know power meters were new and thank god like we it gave us this currency to talk about because you know we used to talk drag and I mean I remember I spent two years going to Europe trying to sell aero wheels to pro teams and you know they just stare through you like yeah but they don't if they worked, we'd be riding them, you know, <laughs> and it's like, arrow doesn't matter. What's it weigh? You know, and, and um, but it's amazing to me. I mean, I, I, I go there now to work with teams and there's still, you know, not to pick on them, but I mean, a lot of like the Spanish and French teams um, mm. are, are, st- are still of that, that mindset. Um, yeah. And so it's amazing to me that it, in the early 2000s, I was thinking, wow, you know, this is a, as long as we can keep this stuff secret. Like, this is going to be a huge advantage for somebody. But, you know, by 2010, like, the cat's out of the bag. I mean, it, yeah. you know, it's like like car racing, right? Like, you know, everybody's going to have come to the same solution. All the bikes are going to look the same. Everybody And, and I look around, and I'm like, wow, it's still – I would say it's probably not a majority of pros that are in the mindset yet. Yeah. Is, that, is, is that kind of your experience I, <laughs> from being oh, in, in it on the inside? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I just like it's, there's been some real like head banging. I, I sat in a room where a, a company. I don't, you know, I don't want to name names or throw any companies under the bus, but we sat in a room where a company who had made a product that we had to use. I I, I was like, this doesn't make sense. This, this is slower, and we just like we were going and going and going at them and, and they one of the riders had tested it and he's like I don't like it it's slower and they, in the end they said we actually don't mind if you lose one more like lose one extra race a year compared with last year we need you to use this equipment I was just like this is absurd <laughs> and then the t- like the team folds because they're like well you don't win anything and I like, <laughs> just like and it's, that, the wow. margins are so small between riders that if you give one rider a disadvantage, then it's, it's massive. But then mentally as well, yeah. if the riders know this, they're just like, well, what's the point? Like, what, what is the point? Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's, yeah, it's tough. Um, it's t- I, I, I would have to try to educate teams without being the guy that's like, Constantly going, oh, like bloody Alex banging on about again about going faster. <laughs> it was like, yeah, like, that is me. <laughs> I, but so you'd have to find ways of um, showing them. So yeah. I, I found a loophole in my contract where I, for world championships, I could use anything I liked. And we had, um, like Factor have now made a phenomenal time trial bike. But the one before wasn't great. Um, and I went to Worlds with a um, unbranded shiv, and uh, this is Worlds in um, yeah, Worlds that Ghana one doesn't narrow it down much, but Worlds in Imola, in Italy. <laughs> and I had a horrible ride. Like a hor- I, I, I was well under. I was about forty watts under what I should have done, um, hmm. and I finished ninth. And my teammate clocked four hundred and forty watts to my 390 and was a couple of minutes behind and he was using all of the team's kit and I was I like handpicked everything that I was using mm. and I sort of presented it to the team afterwards like can does this not is this not everything you want to see like you have the you have the power numbers you have our weights you mm. have the only difference here is equipment mm-hmm. and it's night and day like we're not in the same race here and yeah. and then but then you know, then things start to change, and then they, you know, it just, yeah, you have to win races to secure sponsors, and so you have to focus on performance. That's ultimately, yeah. it's, it sounds so simple, but I think in terms of teams becoming like economically 
stable winning races is the best thing you can do because um, then sponsors are happy because a lot of the sponsors are there out of it's, it's not often a smart business decision to sponsor a cycling kit team I don't think if you <laughs> it's, it's usually I think that's the same across a lot of sport it's generally a fan at the top that's like you know what we're going to sponsor a cycling yeah. team this, this year but and then so they want to they want to see their logo winning bike races and that's um and I think then that becomes so important. So then performance has to be at the forefront and it's still taking some time with a few teams. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, we talk on the show a lot too about the, the money ball aspect of this, you know, the, the kind of the aggregate, you know, if every rider on average is finishing even a couple spots higher, right? And, you know, then you're... You know your UCI points at the end of the year look like this, and it, you know versus that, and you know we get into you know, relegation and I mean, all of that stuff. It's it, it it's really important, and and I think the one that, that forever has driven me nuts is a lot of this stuff is not that hard. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of this is um, you know, hey guys, like we we should all be wearing the speed suit every day, <laughs> right? I don't need you in a, like a full arm skin suit every day, but like you know. You're a Castelli team. They make a beautiful skin, or, you know, a, a speed suit. Like, wear it. You know, yeah. Or the socks, right? Yeah. Everybody should be on the Aero socks oh, every this, day. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah. Um, it, and then very few of them actually do it. Um, yeah, so it it's, but yeah. I, I remember Dan, yeah, I chatted to Dan <laughs> Bigger. It's like a breath of fresh air sometimes because he's having the similar battles <laughs> that I'm having. And he... But he's, I think, a team time trial at the Tour of Britain, and he was like, he did an inventory of everyone's kit. Because, you know, the, the team they rode for, it, it's it's not like a, a you know, ribble weld type punched well above their weight. But ultimately, like, they, we have our TT bikes brought to the race for us, and the mechanic sets them up, but those riders are bringing their TT bikes to the race. So Dan does an inventory, and I think with one of the riders, it had a, um, a KMC chain on, and Dan's like, put a Dura race chain on. And <laughs> the rider's like, really? He's like, yeah, yeah, put it on. So it turns up, and there's still the KMC chains on there. Dad's like, where's the Juro's chain? He's like, well, you know, how much faster is it? He's like, well, why? The, the, I could tell you, but why should that matter? Why, like, is, it, why is that? Like, where's the mentality? Like, if something is faster, yeah. we are trying to cross a finish line first. Like, we're trying to win a race. Like, and speed is the most important metric of the day whether you're going uphill downhill or anything um it, it just it's a it's a crazy um you know so if you were to say to a runner these trainers are faster and they go you know what i'll line up themselves i'm just gonna go with them. <laughs> <laughs> uh, reluctance does not win races right <laughs> jeez from a, from yeah. a tech standpoint alex during your career, what was the what was the most marginal, gainiest thing to come your way? Uh, probably that ceramic speed, um, the ceramic speed aero oversized pulley wheels really? uh, <laughs> that was made last year. It was just like they, they found 0.8 of a watt in the wind tunnel. I was like, and for 800 pounds or 800 bucks, I was yeah. like, that, that's just, that's the. Like, <laughs> That's for the that's for the guy really. I mean, like, you know, I, I was lucky. One, yeah. one just turned up on my bike. I was like, all right, I'll take that point eight of a watt. But I think that was the. I think yeah, there's certainly a psychological thing there. I was, like, I was the only one in the Giro with one on my road bike. And you see people looking. You know, they're like, oh, it's, <laughs> Douse has got that again. Like Douse has got something new. It's like yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that's so awesome. that's the. That's the that's the smallest, but I think that mental aspect is quite quite important. I, I, every so often, if I had something new, I'd make sure everyone knew about it. Like I had heated trousers for the train Adriatico TT, and you've only, you only start with a few people around you, but you walk into the warm up pen and you see everyone looking because you've got a flashing LED on your trousers. And you're like, oh, what's that? It's like, oh, I'm onto something. Like, like yeah. extended warm up. You just see them like, oh, you've got something I haven't. I think the big one was Steve um, Cummings in the Commonwealth Games. Um, in the time trial, both of us were representing England, and 
I'd had uh, and the thing is with things like the Olympics you you have like an overall national team sponsor who have to make everything they they have to make the the running vests the the rugby jerseys and the cycling skin suits so everything is pretty below par Um, Mm -hmm. so I'd got my cycling I got my skin suits and overshoes made by uh, Endura who were sponsored Mobby Star at the time and I remember sat with Steve Gummins and you know like time trials you want to win and you want your teammate to finish second like you want to support them but you're the one that wants to win um, and I remember I sat there with Steve and he's, he's looking at my bike at the time which was the Canyon and he had his BMC and it was just before they released the newer one he's like it's a good bike that Canyon isn't it and I was like yeah it's really good <laughs> <laughs> and I pulled my skin suit out of the uh, out of the bag, and he looked at his mind, looked at his. He's like, "What was that?" I said, "Oh, I got enjoyed to make my skin suit for this." And he's like, "Oh, is it fast?" I was like, "Yeah, really fast." He's like, "Ah." Oh. And then right at the end, I just pulled my overshoes out, and he had these like flappy little, like you know, real basic sort of like overshoes. And I had all these long things with the silicon dots in before the UCI banned them and everything. And he just looked at there and he just went, oh, for, for, for F's sake. <laughs> and I was, I was like, I've beaten, mm. I've, I've beaten Steve today. Like, that's job yeah. done. Um, <laughs> you know, there's, 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 I think that uh, mind game aspect isn't to be ignored as well as, as a marginal game, if, uh, if you know how to play it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, as we, I mean, we say all the time, like, you know, the, the ultimate is if we can get the technologically best solution to also be the placebo. <laughs> yeah. it, it, you know, like you believe it, you know, it's like you're the ceramic speed arrow gauge. It's eight tenths of a, of a watt. Yeah. That's non-zero. And it makes yeah. me feel awesome. And, yeah. and the added effect of everyone else going, oh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's, <laughs> uh, it's like, you know, years ago we, when we first put, um, cancel R on the 808s for road stages mm. and you know he won that like kilometer off the front thing at the i don't remember what stage at the tour and and it was just great because you know we, it was at the tour that year and the next day he's like he's like we we need to do that again i mean just to fuck with them you know? <laughs> and you're like yeah <laughs> like, like you show up on that setup and people go oh shit you know, it's it's probably the it's sound of them as those. well isn't it that yeah. would have been the sound as well you'd hear him like, you'd hear yeah. him coming that'd be terrified because you know it's cancel out and like oh god hold on to your seat belts here we go <laughs> yeah yeah that's that's good stuff yeah uh, you mentioned dan bigham and uh the arrow record <laughs> there uh we are we just got done watching ghana break it uh, after dan mm-hmm. broke it and boy those two and that team really dialed down uh into the marginal games to, to get that record they left nothing unturned I want to take you back to the, your your record breaking attempt. What was your? I mean, what were the things you were chasing as far as what could help you break that record, both physiologically and and equipment wise? Um. So, I think that record um, was the first time I really. Because the thing is, with when you find a game, it doesn't make a time trial hurt any less. You just go a bit faster. Whereas with the hour record, it's like if we can, I have to ride at 52 and a half kilometers an hour to break the record. Now, if, if something's going to make that 10, 15, 20 watts easier, I, I'm, I'm here for it. Um, so what was cool, everything I'd do in training would be around the 400 watt mark, but we were like adding stuff up, like, you know, skin suit should get this, and the, like the drivetrain optimization should get this, and the temperature in the velodrome, and the fact that we're moving from London to Manchester and, and, and in my mind it's like everything's going to bring this down to this wattage down that I'm going to need to put out um, so and I think the, the biggest thing we worked on was the skin suit um, with Endura we just we knew we were onto something there they made 53 different sort of 53 different suits as we were working through just trying to get faster and faster and faster wow. and it was number 52 I used at the end 53 had a, a better fabric on the legs but it was so stretchy that the, after it's like on the wind tunnel it was, we did a 12 minute run on the wind tunnel and the I, the CDA would go up throughout the test 
and we worked out it's because the top half wasn't being held in place by the bottom half and the top half mm. was losing form and it would end up even though it would start faster it wouldn't finish faster and obviously um, mm. yeah so we went with number 52 um, so yeah that was the I'd say that's where we're finding the most but then I think the bit that was staggering to me is I the drivetrain stuff I left in the capable hands of a close friend of mine um, and he was like I'm going to do this like groundbreaking new thing to your chain I'm going to boil it in paraffin in my, on my kitchen sink and then um, and Bobby still lost their shit because my drivetrain disappeared overnight three nights before the hour record <laughs> and, <Yeah. I> didn't <laughs> <know>. <laughs> so, and then came back and he was like yeah but look at this look at this look how well it moves and they um, uh, like the gold plated rear or titanium nitride oh it was gold it was shiny rear sprocket um, yeah. and I just know the drivetrain just went silent I could not hear a thing and, and yeah. the track bikes can be pretty cranky and noisy and mm. I was like oh this is this is different um, and, and so all of those things yeah we were I was ready for a 400 watt ride and it ended up being a 360 watt ride um, which was great because uh, it was a very enjoyable hour record um, <laughs> and I it was, it was great but then it was frustrating because I could have I could have gone a bit quicker. I could have gone quite a bit quicker, but we'd we'd seen what Bob Bridge had put himself through by overcooking himself early on. Um, yeah. And then and Bobby Star were like, we are here to break the record and we're not here to show off or mm. um, try and knock it out of the park. Because also we knew Wiggins was coming and we knew you know, his calibre was, was going to... Yeah, we were pretty confident he was going to take it, um, and that was fine. But yeah, you know, looking back, I was like, I could have given him more trouble than I did. Um, but yeah, you know, I was doing Moby Star and put so much into it that I was, um, yeah, I had to respect the pacing schedule. And there's also it's an unknown. Like the second uh, second half an hour is is the unknown territory. So if you don't respect it at the start, it's going to bite you in the second. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's just a lot of them coming together. Um, Campag mate, had just gone from the Ghibli, which is a very old wheel, to the, I think they call it the Pista, which is a very commonly used track wheel now. Suddenly the velodrome felt bumpy. Um, so obviously these were still the days. I mean, even now I was using tubs with like 140, 150 PSI in them. Um, Obviously now Ganner and Bigger were the first ones to use tubeless on the track, um, which yeah, I guess it was always going to come. Um, maybe tracks a little more like archaic again than the road. And the, you know, why would you need soft tyres if it's a perfectly smooth track? But um, yeah, that's that. I missed that um, on my second attempt. I was still on yeah Victoria Pista Evos. Oro, no, Pistol Oros, the really fast Vittorias, yeah. which is not, yeah. bad, not a bad tyre at all. Um, and we tested low pressures up to high pressures and found uh, no difference, actually, which was interesting. But then, obviously, obviously the Ineos boys found something. <laughs> yeah, they, they really have all the stops pulled out. I mean, Dan and his spreadsheet... Um, <laughs> You know, he and I talk occasionally, and it's it's because I have a spreadsheet too. And like I'll show you know, show me yours. I'll show you. <laughs> like no, <laughs> it's, it's tight to the yeah. chest. Yeah. But <clears throat> but yeah, I mean the the where that technology is going, the track will be the last to con to convert. But the money being spent in tubeless development right now is tremendous, and you know ultimately you just you've got a simpler structure, right? It's lower hysteresis in the materials, but. There's just less um, stuff in the tubeless yeah. tire than, you know. And, and you've got the glue hysteresis and all that stuff with your... Um, so, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty exciting times, although I think... I, I know I had what, two or three athletes we were talking with about our record attempts. And then once Ghana set his, everyone's like, nope, I'm out. Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's... I, I, I'm hopeful that somebody comes along with... Because I think God, where he's put it, it is pretty discouraging to even try. Um, I, I was, I was surprised. 
I, yeah, I thought he was going to break it. I did not see that coming. I know Gamma has an abundance of power. I think his CDA is roughly the same as mine. But I know like that that curve is exponential. Like the power required to yeah. go, the, the, the increase in power required to go just a little bit further gets worse and worse. And it just to lump that much on is is it's going to take a special human to. I thought for a while Remco, given a, a, a insane CDA and mm. um, uh, and uh, a, yeah enough power. But I think you've got to have the track. I think you've got to be a track rider now um, mm. to be able to do that. Maybe like Ethan Hater, perhaps. Um, mm. He's got an incredibly low CDA and a good power, but just it's. I think the, co- the commitment needed from someone as well now is, is colossal, and it's, the pressure involved with that is colossal, so you've got to devote a lot of time to it. Um, I mean, yeah. Gunner's on the track all year round, um, as is Dan. Like, Ethan isn't. Um, he does plenty of track, but he's... Yeah, I, I, I think he's perhaps the only one right now that could perhaps give it a... A challenge, but even then, I don't know if he could do it. I think Gano probably wants to hit 57. Uh, his <laughs> demeanour after that attempt, I mean, he was, I think he was a bit disappointed. He hadn't had the best season last year, so he probably thought there was yeah. maybe a bit more in the locker. So maybe Gano's the one to break Gano's out. Yeah, he. he <sighs> and, and if you look at his, I mean, his negative split was beautiful, mm. but he he still fell apart in the last 10 minutes. Yes. And so I think there's there's got to be some lingering thought there you know that, oh, if yeah. I, just, I think if he sh- I mean just mathematically if he just shallowed the um, the the negative split strategy and maybe held for another couple of minutes he's got it yeah, um, yeah. So, uh, I travel to the Velodrome to watch that myself I think <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes <laughs> that's brilliant uh, so uh, as we get into the thing about your your dad uh, you know being a British touring car champion did did you grow up like a gearhead and and into the marginal gainy stuff and then it just transferred to bicycles or uh, did you find the bike first and then get no, to I was uh, very much into cars I, I wanted to go go karting and you the problem with racing cars nowadays you need a bigger pool of money than you do a pool of talent um, and that, that, that sort of sort of steered me away from it um, <laughs> quite quickly <laughs> so yeah very much my dad had my dad was on the talented side of the spectrum back then. and back then you could be one or the other you'd be talented or you could be rich and, and dad was talented mm. and uh, his, his his name's on the wall in the British Racing Drivers Club um, at the Silverstone st- circuit in the UK and we go to the Grand Prix uh, most year. Well, Dad's not that interested in going. I'm interested in going. So, um, and I talked to all of his his old colleagues, and they'd all have stories to tell about just how good Dad was. Um, and but he said, I I sort of say, well, if you're it, 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 the first funny story is me wondering like, when we did go to the Grand Prix, we'd turn up with we'd have a caravan and a Volvo estate car um, and dad was talking to a guy that I know he was better than and this, they were sort of chatting like, how are you, how are you right? and this guy was like oh not good going through a divorce at the moment so you know money's tight and he said to dad all about you and dad's like yeah yeah great and then it's like um, what car are you driving and my dad's like oh I've got a Volvo T5R which was the touring car it was the one that was mm-hmm. in the touring mm-hmm. car championship. It was a good-looking Volvo. <clears throat> Dad said, what about you? He's like, well, that's my lime green Lamborghini Mercury. I'll go over there. And I'm like looking yeah. at my dad. It's like, I thought you were good. Like, where's our yeah. lap, though? <laughs> <laughs> and I think I was like nine at the time. Mm. Um, and then he sort of came, came to realise that it was, um, it's, it's very much a, a wealthy man's hobby uh, for a lot of, a lot of people. And, <laughs> So, yeah, as uh, I know my dad got to a point where Toyota had offered him a drive 
uh, full time drive in Japan um, with them. But Dad said that he, yeah, they, they sacrificed. Mum and Dad remortgaged their house to fund racing for another year. Um, and Dad said, but we didn't sacrifice enough. He says, we did that, which I thought was a big sacrifice. Mm. Nigel Mansell sold his house and bought a caravan and lived in that for a year to fund his racing. He's like, that's the level of sacrifice I should have. Well, it's just the level of sacrifice. It's not that he should have. I don't think he regrets it, but he's like, that's what it would have taken. Um, yeah, so it's I'd, required. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'd come along. I'd been diagnosed with hemophilia. Um, and I think there was time for Dad to stop and uh, okay, set up a carpet cleaning business which was successful and um, but yeah I mean to answer your question a big fan of motor racing I love like the tech in Formula 1 is just mind blowing I, I saw a, there's a picture of I'm, I'm a Lewis fan I'm a Lewis Mercedes fan um, <laughs> there was a picture posted last year before all of the rule changes this year of the Red Bull side pods and the, the, the or the side the floor plate in front of the side pods, and it's the most okay, intricate yep. piece of it's the most intricate piece of <clears throat> carbon fiber. There's like wings and like little like flares and everything. It, it's an absolute work of art. It's like this is this is mental. Like, it's just yeah yeah. What they're doing there is 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 staggering. It's um that's crazy. It's, uh, interesting. Yeah, I no, had really. the upper, yeah. I walked around two different factories because all of our error testing was done at the Mercedes wind tunnel um, back with the hour record. So they took me around the factory and it was very much like we walked fast. You didn't look at anything for too long. If you sort of slowed down, there's a push on your back, like move along, keep your phone in your pocket. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I also had the opportunity to walk around a factory of the now like defunct Caterham team and I was like, you want to sit in the car? Yeah, go on, go sit in the car. We'll plug the <laughs> wheel in. Like, have a good look around. Like, you're really good. Yeah, take some photos. <laughs> okay, it was, it was a big level of difference between the top and the bottom of the grid here. Right. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's yeah, they don't have total yeah, I mean, wall, it, it, obviously. Yeah. Right. Right. yeah, we, you know, it's funny here in, in Indy, it's not quite F1 level, but obviously we have IndyCar and... Um, and I've actually I've been fortunate enough to tour Red Bull a number of years ago in a, through a CFD development we were working on, and um, the the level of difference is just massive, right? You look at like the Indy car, and it's it looks like stuff that we could make. And I mean, our Zip in the early days, we were making wings and seats and driver steering wheels, and you see some of this F1 stuff, and you're like my God, I mean, it's you know they're using materials that you can't buy, and then they're doing things with it that you know 20 years of composites engineering, and you're like, oh, what? What the hell is that? How did you do that? <laughs> That's not, I mean, they're, they're just, they're so far out there. It's its just beautiful. Yeah. But then you look and you're like, yeah, that's why a front nose assembly is $150,000, you know, when they crash the car. And, and then then people I, were complaining about what bicycles cost. You. <laughs> but I, but I think, yeah, the problem <laughs> is, is cycling is heading not that way, but it's becoming, uh, there's an element of unaffordability to cycling that's it's certainly ravaged the UK um, TT scene because suddenly mm. now if you spend if you've got 200 watts at your disposal and you spend 10 to 15 thousand pounds on your time trial setup you're going to go faster than someone with a thousand pounds to spend and 300 watts so I think it's put a fair few people off and even at the yeah. sort of top level I, I Endura had the fastest skin suit which is now I think the no pins around the 400 pounds mark which a lot of people would sort of be like that's a lot of money to spend on the skin suit I, I sp spent 5,000 pounds twice on a skin suit um, with Vortec and then the hour record skin suit cost me 14,000 pounds for a skin suit which is mental wow. and <laughs> so I, we've done some testing since then it didn't stack up because you're paying for the R&D and unfortunately the R&D didn't work out as well as um, they and I had hoped so it wasn't hmm. yeah, I don't want to talk about it because it wasn't a, small, it wasn't a good £14,000 to spend but <laughs> the problem is you, you start hearing stories then of, of national federations going if we need to be competitive in the Olympics we need to spend we need to put 
the skin suits on the team pursuit and the team sprint squad and we need to keep up with everyone else so that's what that's the seven five thousand pound skin suits we don't have the budget for that where can we pull budget from oh the junior program we'll pull it from the junior mm. improved program i know there's a federation that did that and then that's when i think alarm bells are going to be ringing in the uci saying we need to put a stop to this because it's going to it, it's going to change uh cycling and that's yeah i mean i think you know the gb track team has long done it and kind of just slipped under the radar with it where they've made bikes that yes you can buy them there's a 50 year wait list and they're sold out right so you right, cannot right. you cannot buy them um so I, I think the i think something will be done um i know that uh, they've gone down the formula one route as well where i think if if a team innovates and creates something new other teams the most expensive thing to do is to build their own. The cheapest thing to do is go up to the FIA or the UCI and go, that looks illegal, you should deal with that. <laughs> and I think at, the, yeah. at Tokyo, the track commissaires were tearing their hair out with all of the sort of name calling and you know, like the, the Danes Shinjiri tape being probably right. the most notable. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so... Um, yeah. Although I think that was as much head game as as marginal yeah. game. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> but but uh, I said to Dan and, and afterwards, and the successful one. Right? Yeah, yeah. I, I said to Dan Bingham afterwards. I was like, why? Oh, why did they use it in the qualifier? Surely you knew it was <laughs> going to get banned. Like, roll it out for the final because I don't know what the UCI would have done then. You know, if a medal's been decided and then they retrospectively go, well, now you've got some kinesio tape on your shins. We're gonna we're gonna DQ DK- you. It's not gonna look good and yeah Dan, I think Dan was like yeah I know <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well this arms race discussion brings up another good point and that is uh, real time CDA on bikes and we've seen Formula 1 put pedo tubes all over cars and get data that they know how to use and crunch the numbers for uh, Alex you're involved with a company Body Rocket that, that's attempting to do this bring something to the market uh, we talked about it on the show before too like what are the hang-ups here? How good can it really be? There's obviously variables you really can't control on a bike that can affect real-time CDA. Hmm. How close is this to becoming a reality? And, and who's it for in the end? Who's Who would really buy or use real-time CDA for on a bicycle sense? I, I mean, it's not going to start cheap. Um, I think the aim is to make it cheaper than a wind tunnel and cheaper than purchasing track, like, even velodrome aero testing sessions mm. so um, for me I, I tested the body rocket system and it's as it, yeah, the real time CDA is great the the bike fit opportunities for it are mind blowing because you can see so I shuffle um, and that's something mm. that they're looking into quite a lot now so I, I I do four or five pedal strokes, push myself back on the saddle. Four or five mm-hmm. pedal strokes, push myself back. You see a lot of time trialists do it. Um, on a good day, it'll be every 20 pedal strokes. On a bad day, it'll be every three. Um, what the system could tell me is I actually didn't shuffle back. It was just one sort of side of my hip was being dragged forwards, and then I was pushing that back. And I would always push off my left foot, and it would be about an 800-watt spike when I'd do it. And then we could calculate the loss of CDA between shuffles, and um, since then they've sort of done some digging and worked out that some people CDA improves, some people are faster for shuffling, some people are slower. Um, <laughs> so I think what it is, it's gonna, it's a system that can measure every, the thing that I'm fascinated with is a prospect for team sprint and team time trial um, stuff. Cause there's not. There's only, I know there's a Belgium in wind. There's a Belgium in wind tunnel. There's a wind tunnel in Belgium where you can put a rider behind another rider in a wind tunnel. Because, you know, we test everything, being the first person to hit the wind. But what happens when you're second, third, and fourth wheel? Right. Um, so I think that there's going to be an interesting application for that for the system. Um, yeah, I mean it works. There's just, there's a lot of it at the moment. Um, there's a lot of sensors. The the it still needs to be refined and we're getting there um, or the, I'm not like the, you know, I, I, 
I test and feedback the the guys are building that are, are getting there, and it's it's tough. But I think you know, it's real time CDA is coming. Um, I would say Body Rocket are the furthest up the road with something that's reliable. Um, I think, um, but it's tough. I think it's also tough because it's such like relatively slow speeds. Um, yeah. You start testing wind speed on jet fighters and, and drag, it becomes very easy because it's so mm -hmm. fast. Um, I mean, I know with wind suit, wind suit, wind tunnel, um, wind, sorry, skin suit testing in a wind tunnel, um, the slow speed stuff has been the really tricky. Um, the tricky area to find gains in. Once things are over 55, 60 k an hour, it gets much easier to work out what's fast, what's slow, and why. Um, so I think that's that's probably the biggest challenge with real time aero testing because it is because it's all the outdoor stuff. It's all actually quite slow speed stuff. If you're on the velodrome, anything important is happening above 60 k an hour. Um, it's fascinating, though. It really is fascinating. <laughs> It's such a hard problem to solve. <laughs> the, the, like those low Reynolds number flows are just, they're dirty. Mm -hmm. There's lots of transients. There's, you know, quick directional changes. Yeah, it's, um, yeah. It, it's exciting. Once it's there, right? it's going to be. It's, yeah. I think once it's there, what will be good is proteins will have another number to look at. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So it won't be a case of how heavy are you and how much power they will can go <laughs> like, well, this is how aerodynamic you are. And that is... Yeah, yeah, once it's there, I think that's gonna it's gonna help pro teams massively. Certainly, the pro teams at the sort of further down the the order that can educate them and say, okay, this is now this is something we can focus on. But this is also something that we now know how to focus on, and we can do that themselves ourselves rather than outsourcing mm -hmm. to other companies to do help us with our testing, which you know is expensive. So I think mm -hmm. affordable. Yeah, affordable wind tunnel is is that that's the main goal for Body Rocket is the so that everyone can have access to to reliable real time CDA. Yeah, that that's a great point too because I, I to our error discussion earlier, like the big pushback from so many of those smaller teams and. and maybe a little bit more backwards thinking teams is like if if it worked everybody would be doing it and and the problem now is that they they don't necessarily see the top teams doing it you know the the and i think as soon as it's you know they're showing up and looking around going oh shit everybody's got one of these things and they're all beating us then it's going to be oh yeah of course the the cda number oh yeah we, we pay attention to the cda number yeah. <laughs> whereas today it's that is not the, that is not how that discussion goes, <laughs> as you know. <laughs> no, I, I like. I mean, there's that age old. If it looks, I'm always like, if it looks fast, it probably is. Um, <laughs> and then I saw Cask started sticking wings on visors. I was like, well, that's just going to throw it all out the window now again. You going to start yeah. putting wings on stuff <laughs> and all sorts. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's a fun area of investigation right now. I know a lot of people are looking at splitter plates for all sorts of mm. places and things and it the UCI seems to be allowing it and it it's really uncharted territory yeah um it's kind of it's exciting certainly exciting for me it, although it probably is just gonna further drive that arms race <laughs> uh, yeah it's, it's, the cost the, it, you know, yeah it just, it just I mean it just kind of it has to be it just has to be a little element of control over it, I guess. Um, and maybe it just comes down to what you can, how much you can sell a bike for. Like you, if you can't put a bike up for sale for more than I don't know, ten or fifteen thousand pounds, then that would maybe limit the amount of R and D effort that's spent on on that product, perhaps. Maybe. Yeah, it's a hard one. I, I, you know, I always argue that the flip side of the the coin, and it it doesn't help the racing. But you know, I I do look at, you know, how good, like a thousand dollar bike is today. It's unbelievable, right? I mean, the the, you know, I always joke with my employees here. I've got my Le Mans, as ridden at the Tour de France TVT in the background, and you know that thing was, 
$8,000 in 1990 or whatever. And, you know, it's a terrible bicycle. <laughs> like, it's absolute garbage. But, at the, you know, it was state of the art of the time. But, I mean, you know, for 800 or or $1,000, you can get a bicycle that destroys the tour-winning bikes of, of 20 years ago. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, there is I, – I feel fortunate that at least we can point to some trickle-down yes. um, effect. You know, there there is some – some benefit but of course if, if you're at the pointy end of of racing and yeah you're the you know you're the junior with a lot of talent and and not the rich parents you're you're out of luck you know mm-hmm. I mean, you're, you're in a really tough spot yeah and uh yeah and that's that's the thing i think we'd all like to see how do we solve that problem yeah um, I agree. And it does feel like it it probably is going to have to come down from it i mean i'm sure whether the uci or or, or the the National federations try to solve that rather than making the the silly sock height measuring device, <laughs> you know, and some some of that other nonsense. <laughs> yeah, like guys, just leave that alone and pay attention to this other yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Maybe that's the push we need. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it's nice that I used to be really um, disappointed that they stopped the like the Obrey Boardman era um, innovation, but. I, I get it. I do actually. I understand why a bicycle needs to look like a bicycle still. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's relatable, you know. And I think that's it's aspiring for kids. If you if you do compare it with motor racing, um, anyway, when the UCI banned the, us putting our hands over the handlebars, the puppy paws, they, they called it. Um, I think one of the arguments was like, oh, it's it's you know, kids are doing it now and I said so we need to stop because it sets a bad example and I was like is the FAA slowing Lewis Hamilton down from driving around corners fast <laughs> like in case they teenagers in their first car <laughs> try to do the same like you know, there's a balance to be had here but like, come on like, this is yeah <laughs> like, let us race and um, yeah it's the I, I, it's, it is a tough it is a tough one though because it's easy to draw the similarities to motor racing but it is not motor racing and it's you know when you go to like running I find like get, delving into the world of running was hilarious because I am not very good at it but I was like immediately I was like right the tech what's the talk to me about running shoes and the progression of running shoes has been nothing short of staggering in the last sort of 10 years you've gone from shoes that are this thin to now shoes that are this thick <laughs> and it's carbon sole so I, I, I was like right well Kipchoge runs in these shoes so they must be the fastest I went it was 270 pounds and I was like right right so that's what it takes to get like the best of the best in running is 270 pounds this is great this is great like, <laughs> Um, and then, but then I turned up to. I, I think running is, is hilariously. Well, I, I might be jumping the gun, but I think it's hilariously far behind. I, I said I don't know where to put my nutrition, and runners are like, "Nutrition? You don't need that." <laughs> and I'm like, oh, and everyone talks about hitting a wall in the marathon around about the twenty mile mark. I wonder why." <laughs> 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 um, yeah, so it's, it's yeah. I think you. I I always used to draw the motor racing comparison, but I don't. I think it's good to compare, but not to use one as a, a definitive example to the other. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. You want me All to right. wrap it up here? How do, should we? Yeah. Should we, we wrap it? We, I, we, uh, I think. So. I think we're, we're definitely yeah. probably at our. No, Time this is all great. I would not get in the way of yeah. this at all. So, I'll, I'll put a little bow on it, and <laughs> we'll, uh, unless you want, you want me to lock it out, or you want to do it, Josh? No, you do it. You got a better voice. Okay, than me. cool. Yeah, well, not about the better voice. I mean, it's golden <laughs> radio voice right there. I nobody <laughs> wants to listen to my marginal voice. gains of podcasting. Marginal gains of podcasting. That's right. Really That's right. Yeah. Got Alex's accent, Hottie's golden radio <laughs> voice. Like, yeah. Yeah. I'm the last person on this podcast that anybody wants to hear. 
Uh, well, Alex Dow said it's really been a pleasure. Um, we love your takes. You are a marginal gainer. Uh, but better yet, you know how to put it into, into context, which is which is great. And Guillaume Boivin, you were right, my man. <laughs> we need to have Alex Dowsett on the show, and, and uh, we, I think we proved that today. Um, so, Alex, again, thanks for coming on. We'll watch you on Fives Club, your, your YouTube channel, and we thank you again for being part of the Marginal Gains podcast. Uh, thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure.